Good afternoon. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Aminata Cairo, and I am a daughter, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a dancer, I'm a psychologist, I'm a lecturer of inclusive education, I am of Afro-Surinamese descent, I'm a former Dutch citizen and a current American citizen. And so why do I say all those things? Why do I bring that with me? Because that's my story and that's part of the story that I want to bring to you. So part of my heritage is from the Netherlands and part is from Suriname, so I want to share something with you. In the Netherlands, we have a saying. We were saying when you have arrived, when you've done something, you say, ha ha. So I want all of you to say, ha ha. Very good, because you know, you've been here for a couple of days. <laughs> You've been here, you have listened, you've taken in all this information, so, you know, and you are here. Some of us are already gone, but you are here. So we can say, ha ha. Yeah. Good. And then another thing we say in Suriname, we say, undoro. Everybody say, undoro. undoro. And undoro means we have arrived. Okay? So I want you to go to, turn to your name and say, ha ha, undoro. Go ahead. Yes, very nice, because we are here, and that means something. And something just happened on this stage, and, and this is my first time here, but I've been told that every year you have a choir. And you don't sign up in advance, it's when you come here, you get together, all these different people, you just get together and sing. And I, would, I want you to understand that this is not just for your entertainment, but what they gave you is some medicine. Right? Well, they gave you with some balm for your soul because you've heard some heavy stuff over these past few days. You've heard some heavy stuff. Your head is full and what they gave you is like, ooh, yeah, hair, yeah, hair. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they did that for you. Yeah, that's very special. Right? And so before we get started, I'm going to give you a little bit more. Before we get started, as nice as it is that they sang, that was just some of you. And the theme of this conference is encompassing all voices. So, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot leave here without raising all of our voices. Yes? Yes? All right. Thank you. Okay. So, I'm going to sing Vi Kong, Vi Kong, and you are going to answer with Ja. Simple, right? So, I say Vi Kong, Vi Kong. Ja. Vi Kong, Vi Kong. Good. And then we all sing Vikong, Vikong, Ja. Yes? Yes? Yeah, yeah. yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. We Kong, we Kong. Ja. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. This, this, look how many of you are here. If we can raise the roof, all right? We can raise the roof, people. You're getting ready to go. I want to send you off well. So come on now. Let me hear you. We Kong, we Kong. Ja. Yes. Family, we Kong, we Kong. Ja. Everybody. We Kong, we Kong. Ja. We Kong, we Kong. Ja. Ja. Everybody, we call, we call, ja. Give yourself a hand. Yes, so now we can get started. So we call means we come together, and ja means right here, right now. So just a moment to say, Ugh, we are here, and that means something, right? And in a minute, you are going to leave, and you've been here with all these people, with like-minded people who are dedicated to education, who are dedicated to making a change in education, and that means something. And so again, the theme for today is encompassing all voices. And so why are we talking about that? Obviously, we are aware that there are all kinds of voices when it comes to our education, when it comes to young people, but we are also aware that there's something not quite right. And so the board of this association has said, we need to address this. 
And so even though you have gone to your individual sessions and about interna internationalization, all these kinds of things, underneath it all, there was this idea, we also want you to keep this in mind, there's something about encompassing our voices that we want you to take with you, that we want you to address when you go back to wherever you came from uh, in the world, not even Europe, in the world. I know we have representations from all over the world. And so for today, what I'm going to address with you, and I'm going to keep it simple. First, we have to understand what the story is, how it came to be. And then, so we're saying that there's some difficulty here, we want to address it. Well, if we want to fix it, what are the obstacles that we have to overcome so that we can address it? And then three, what do we need to do? What is the charge? I'm going to give to you a charge. And again, I'm going to keep it simple because, no, you've been here for a while, right? And you've had all this information, so we're going to keep it simple. So, here we go. Work with me. Here we go. So what I want to start with, this is a drawing from my oldest son. And I'm not just putting it up here to brag, maybe just a little. <laughs> so <laughs> this is my oldest child um, who is very dedicated to encompassing all voices. He always says, you know, mom, there's not enough images for, for girls. And, and so he feels it's very important to have great diversity when it comes to the images for girls. Well, a number of years ago, I took my son to art school in the United States. This was my oldest. You know, you're going to take your baby to college. The United States is a very, very big country. So 12 hours by car, and I'm going, and you're like, oh, I'm going to throw my baby off. You know, it's a little bit hard. Then we got there, and it was kind of OK. Because, you know, artist people, you know, they're a little bit different. And so finally we got there and there were all these artists like, oh, here are your people, go be with your people, yes. And so I was happy for him that he was in the right place so he could do his thing. And we started in a big basketball arena, very American style. You know, all these first year students and their parents. And it was a big show. Oh, yeah, you're one of us. Yeah, yeah, we're so happy you're here. All African-American students stand up. Latino students stand up. Asian students, Native Americans, because in the U.S., that's how we do, right? I'm in the Netherlands now. That is not how we do. But in the U.S., oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes, right? International students, look at all the diversity we have. And indeed, there was great diversity. It was impressive. Like, yes, my child, go do your thing. Three weeks later, he calls me up. He says, Ma, guess what? We're studying art history. We're skipping African art. We're skipping Asian art. We're skipping oceanic art. All we're going to study is European art history. This is the top art institution in the United States. All right. So it's cute that you call out all this diversity that's present. That's nice. But what happens about which story is being told? Right? Which story is being told as valuable? Which story is being told as important? Which story is being told as the dominant story? Right? And so what we have is that we started with all these stories, and for some reason, there's one story that has risen to the top. Of course, we're going to study this story, because this is important. This is valid. And there's nothing wrong with that story. I like that story, too. But what happens with all those other stories? Right? And so we have this range of stories, and as one has risen and become dominant, those other stories become less valid, invalid, overlooked, silenced, marginalized, cute, entertaining, oh, if we have some time left over, extracurricular, et cetera, et cetera, right? And again, I don't want to be clear about this. There's nothing wrong with this story. I like this story, too. But it's just one of many stories. You know? And so our problem is what has happened to these other stories. And so when we're talking about diversity, a lot of times we talk about the fact that we have a range of stories. We know there's a range of stories, but the problem is that we have this. You know, that's the problem that we have. And the thing is, this did not happen overnight. This took hundreds of years in our educational system, in our other systems, to get to this point. This took a long time to get this way, and this has all kinds of complications for who we are, for what we do, for the education that we're trying to pass on. And so again, there's this call to encompass all stories. And so my charge is, how do we honor all of the stories that we have? How do we listen to all of those stories? How do we give them a valid place? Because right now we have this. And this has all kinds of impl implications. So it's not just about the content of story, but it's also about how we do story. How we do research, well, it better be evidence-based. Evidence Nothing wrong with evidence-based, but there's a whole bunch of other ways to do research. 
right? And this is not just limited to education. Any of our institutions have this inequality. So we have this inherent inequality in this institution that we are trying to work with. And it has all kinds of implications. So the goal is to do this. The goal is to connect. The goal is to do this. And so not only do we have this, and it took a long time to get there, there's all kinds of mechanisms that the moment you try to do this, ah, 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 shh, no, 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 let's go right back here. There's all kinds of mechanisms to make sure that this stays in place, right? And so what you will find, again, is people are very willing. It's a great idea. We want to honor all those stories, but, you know, we have limited time. And, of course, we have to tell these stories, right? And so how are we going to come these obstacles? What are the obstacles? This is, here we go. Okay. <clears throat> One of, the one of the things that we have to overcome is that the fact that we have this, it has become normalized. Like I say, this took hundreds of years to get to this point. And so this marginalization has become normal. It has become conditioned. And so the way that we use our language, for instance, we have jokes, we have silencing, we have ridicule. So when you have this, and you're used to being silenced, and you're used to being overlooked, and then you finally are brave enough to open your mouth and say something, they, ah, why do you have to be such a victim? You've heard that one? Mm. You have to just say that one time, and the person will shut up. Never mind, right? And so you try to open your mouth, ah, 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 and we go right back to where we are, right? And so I use, I prefer to use this model of dominant and the other, because a lot of time you hear about white supremacy, you hear about white privilege, it's a thing. It's a theory, but this is not just about white privilege. Yeah, sometimes this is about whiteness and it's about people of color, but this is also about being able-bodied and having a physical disability. It can be about do you have money or do you not have money? Do you come from the city or do you come from the rural area? Is it about adults? Is it about children? At any given moment, can you be up here? At any given moment, can you be up here? And again, there's nothing wrong with being up here. This is about power. We all like to have some power. Shoot, I'd like to have some power, right? Nothing wrong with that. But it's about what do you do with that power? What do you do? So I can say, you know, I have a PhD, so pff, forget you. You know some of those people. You, you work with some of them, right? Don't you dare talk to me. Shoot, do you know who I am? <laughs> you know them. <laughs> or you can say, I have a PhD, so I'll do this. That's a choice, right? What do you do with that power? What are we going to do? And so language is one of the ways that we use to maintain this difference. Calling somebody a victim is one thing. Lately, you know, like I said, I mentioned white privilege. I've, I've seen the concept of white privilege used to shut people up. You know, when people want to engage, ah, well, you know, if you're white privilege, oh, yeah, you're right, Shh, and everything shuts down. Done. Again, it's a theory, it's a valuable theory that helps us understand, but it's also starting to be used as a weapon, you know, and especially within academia. Somebody writes a paper, we publish, we don't question, and we start using these terms. We use terms to shut people up. We use terms to keep people separate, right? There's a concept that we get from the Netherlands. My Dutch people know this word. The word is gezellig. Everybody try to say it. Gezellig. Don't choke. I know it's hard. <laughs> All right? Gezellig. Gezellig means cozy, comfortable. Dutch people would like for things to be cozy, comfortable. Whenever you go to the Netherlands, there will be tea with cookies, you know, everything gezellig. Everybody has to be comfortable. It's a very important part of the culture. And there's nothing wrong with it, except it is so important that when it comes to wanting to have those difficult connections, wanting to make those connections, have those difficult conversations, man, that's not gezellig. Discrimination, man, that's not gezellig, right? And there will be repercussions if you break up the gezelligheid, I'm telling you, right? Man, things were so gezellig, here you have to go talk about this thing. Next time you're not invited to the coffee and the tea, I'm telling you. Right? No, seriously, you're laughing as the Dutch people, they'll tell you. Right? Gezellig is very important. Right? And so it is even to the point that even when I want to speak on something, when I want to address on something, if I do, I'm going to break up the gezelligheid. So I better be quiet. That's the problem. 
so I will censor myself because if I do, ah, uh, people, you know. See, because part of this, part of this privilege, I should be comfortable in any and all time. That's part of this position right here. See, we down here, we used to being uncomfortable. We used to being uncomfortable, but up here, I, have, I should have access to information because, again, my story is always told. My story is always told first. I always have the floor, and I should be comfortable at any and all time, right? So it better not be not gezellig, right? And so to address these kinds of things, when we start addressing this marginalization and exclusion, it is not gezellig. <laughs> and so part of what I do in my work I start up front creating this space because especially in academia, you know, we don't deal with feelings, supposedly, right? We're very much about being up here. And so purposely, I create this space and say, okay, if we're going to do this, if we're really going to go there, it's not going to be gezellig. <laughs> now let's go anyway. Let's do it anyway. You'll be all right. You know, you're not going to implode. You're not going to explode. You're going to be just fine. Okay. And so, I want you to think about, you know, again, we have, we come from all over the world. We have our own local mechanisms that work to exclude people, to keep people in their place. I don't know what it is, where you come from. You know, geselligheid is one of, you know, our things. But you have your own. I want you to think about what it is. You know, and when it happens, you know, recently I witnessed, you know, while some people were being rude and started joking, nobody questioned. Nobody questioned, and it was excluding to some people, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's just how it is. We don't question. We don't, you know, because we don't want to rock the boat. We want to keep it gezellig. But these are the kind of mechanisms. Sometimes these mechanisms are so subtle. Sometimes the mechanisms are more, you know, direct. They're in our policies. You know, in the Netherlands, we know we have an issue with if our Dutch children say they get a score of eight on the test, they get sent to the higher level in schooling. If you're a Moroccan child, if you're a Surinamese child, you get that same eight, they will send you to the lower levels. We all know. It's documented. We know. Every year, we know they get different levels of advice. And what do, what do people say? Well, you know, just to be sure, I'm going to send you down there. Just to be on the safe side. Nobody questions. To be sure about what? To be safe about what? What are you afraid of? This is what the things that parents get to hear, and it's normalized, right? These are the mechanisms that we have that maintain that separation, that prevent us from connecting and honoring those stories. And so I want to be clear about this because sometimes it's very easy to just talk about how bad people up here are, and it's not about that. Again, we all like to have some power. Right? This is about all of us together, about this mechanism that we are a part of and what it has done to us and the work that it requires for all of us to undo this. Right? When you're up here, you're used to having the space all the time. Your story gets told because, of course, your story is valid. When you're down here, you're used to being overlooked, silenced, etc., etc., so you don't open your mouth because you have learned what your place is. So now when we have, okay, we have a diversity policy, we want you to come in and share who you are. You know what these people down here are saying? Like, yeah, sure. Pfft, are you kidding me? I don't trust this. Because it's not just about now. This is about a long story. This is about a long history that we have for coming to this place. This is something from very long that we have to overcome. And so therefore, what it requires of us it's quite a bit of work, quite a bit of soul searching, because that confrontation is harsh for any and all of us. And then I talk about the fragility of the dominant position. It's really interesting. Since I came back from the U.S. to the Netherlands, I hear a lot of people talking about, you know, we need to teach these people down here how to be resilient. And I was like, these people show up every day. They're quite resilient. <laughs> They're fine. <laughs> <laughs> They're not the ones that need the help. <laughs> See, because the people down here, they know their story and they know this story. Because if you want to participate, you have to know this story. It's the people up here that just know this story up here. They have no idea what's happening down here. These are the people who are far more fragile. See, when these people get silenced, they go like, oh, what do you mean I don't get to speak first? These are the ones who are far more fragile. What do you mean? Those down here are like, yeah, we know. Tell me something new. <laughs> right? So that fragility, what that means, and who needs the most help? There is um, 
you know, there's, I know there's some programs where people say, okay, we don't have enough diversity, so we want to bring people in, whether it be about students or faculty or staff, so we're going to train these young people, we're going to train them to come in. They're not the ones that need the help, they know how to do the job. It's the ones who are receiving. <laughs> They're the ones that need help. What do you mean? Why are they going to come? Why should they come? Those are the ones who feel threatened. It's like, you know, my world is being turned upside down. Right? So these are some of the obstacles that we have to overcome. So what must we do? I'm going to give you three charges. We're going to keep it simple. Care, courage, and humility. Number one, you have to care. You have to care. You have to come from a position of caring, and I want to stress that because what we see happening right now is that these voices, whether we want to or not, these voices are becoming louder. In particular, our young people are the ones who are speaking up, who are saying, you know, enough is enough. I want to be heard, I want to be seen, and there's a lot of pain, and there's a lot of anger. This is what we're seeing, this is what we're hearing. And so when our driving force is pain and anger, it makes it very hard to connect. And so you have to start from this point, but I care. I care to hear. Even if I don't have all the answers, I care. And I will show up. I care and I want to address this. I care even though I see the pain, even though I hear the hurt. I care. That message. Because there's a lot of healing that needs to take place. Right? And part of caring is also that you have to learn how to take care of yourself. When you do this work, when you start to create spaces where all these stories are being held as valid, you might not be very popular. <laughs> it might be very hard. You might get a lot of resistance. So even for yourself, when you do this work, there are times you have to say, okay, enough. I need to take care of myself. I need to hear some singing. I need to do something because this kind of work will burn you out very quickly. Okay? Courage. It takes courage to start addressing these issues, to start addressing this system, because especially in academia, you know, these are the systems that give us our rewards. I get rewarded for being up here. So what are you saying now, that I should do it differently? I finally learned how to play all the rules, and what, what are you saying, right? I have to go against what rewards me? That requires some courage. If you speak up, it's not going to be gezellig. Everybody's going to be mad at you. Will you still speak up? So it requires a lot of courage. And lastly, humility. Humility, because I want you to know that when we start engaging and when we start connecting, you're going to say stupid stuff, you're going to say dumb things, you're going to make mistakes. And we need to know that up front. Especially in academia, we're trained, what are the 10 best practices? I want to do it right, I want to do it perfect. You're not going to do it perfect, you're not going to do it right. But try it anyway, and do it anyway, and try it again and again and again until you get it right. Right? And so we have to be humble to know that, you know, we are fallible. And also that the people that we engage with, they will say stupid stuff and do dumb things. And they are fallible. And so a big part of this is that you have to learn how to forgive. Ooh, and that's a hard one. You have to learn how to forgive other people. You have to learn how to forgive yourself. I want to share a story with you. One of the projects that I worked on started in the U.S. is... Um, I have a friend who is transgender and who shared with me, um, we were in presentation together and, and kind of shared with me, when I was transitioning, there were no books for my children. You know, we're going to get a goldfish, I can go to the library, there's a book. Mommy's going to get a baby, there's a book. We're going to get a divorce, there's a book. Mommy's going to become a man, there's no book. So, <laughs> so, I wish there was a book for my children and I was like, we can do something about that. So that semester, I had my applied anthropology course. We engaged with the transgender community and worked with somebody, a children's librarian, and we looked at, in terms of what was avail available, uh, little to nothing. Uh, we engaged, we collected stories, and wrote, uh, ended up writing six or seven stories for children in transgender communities. I had a colleague who does multicultural theater. She said, great, we can do something with that. So we did a reader's theater performance and went around sharing these stories. So I brought that with me to the Netherlands. I engaged with uh, a teen center for LGBT community, and together with these young people, we were going and sharing these stories. Now, one of the people in my group is non-binary transgender. I didn't have experience with non-binary transgender. All my transgender friends were either male to female or female to male, but I had not really dealt 
with non-binary. So at one of the rehearsals, they came to me and they said, I need to tell you something. You keep gendering me and that hurts. Uh. Here I am, Miss Advocate, Miss Ally, think I'm doing so well. And so immediately what I wanted to do into my mechanism, immediately I want to go, oh, but it was not my intention. It's immediately where I wanted to go, right? That's the defense mechanism, but it was not about me. So I had to just shut up and suck it up and listen. And so I like, be quiet and just listen. And they shared how painful it had been. They had not started with the hormones, so they still looked very female, but needed to be dressed or as them or they, and I had not done it. And so all my instincts to want to defend it wasn't my intention. Uh, that's my drama. And it was not about me. I had to be there for them. And I had to be humble and say, oh, you screwed up. And I had to listen. And so I listened, and I said, you know what, you're absolutely right. Now, I cannot promise you that I will not make the mistake again, but I'm from this day on, I will promise you I'm going to fight very hard to make sure that I address you by the proper pronoun. Then the second thing I wanted to do, I wanted to do this. Oh, you're so terrible. Oh, you're so horrible. You think you're all that Miss Ally. You're telling. And then it was still about my drama, right? So I had to let that go too, because it was not about my drama. I had to forgive myself. Yep, you screwed up. And you're probably going to screw up again. Now get back to work and help these young people, because that's what it's about. Right. And so this is the work that is required that we don't often talk about. We have all kinds of interventions, but when we run up against, what we don't talk about and think about enough is what it does to you. When you start engaging with people's story, people who have been silenced and marginalized, it will do stuff to you. It will do stuff to you. But if we want to do this, you know, again, this, this is a system that has been around for a very, very long time. If we want to do this, you know, it requires that we show up. It requires that we are caring. It requires that we are courageous. And it requires that we are humble. Now, there's all kinds of trainings. You know, and I, and I don't want to put them down because we need them and implicit bias and, and you name it. But all the implicit bias trainings in the world are not going to stop people from having the bias. The point is, after the bias has been expressed, can I have the conversation with you? Can I say, you know, what you said really hurt me? That's what comes next. And what kind of reaction will I get? Ah, oh, man, you're so sensitive. You know that one? Stop being so sensitive. Will I get that? Ah, you're blowing it out of proportion. Or will you be able to say, you know what? Let me listen. You have a point. I apologize. I'm going to do my best, whatever. And, and, you know, because to hear criticism, ah, it's not easy, right? But that's about what connects us as human beings, and that's about starting to connect and creating spaces for all those voices. Because, again, these voices have been here a long time. These voices have been here forever. They're just tired of being quiet, right? They are fine. It's us, the majority, who will have to adjust and adapt. They've always been here. That's the secret. They're fine. It's our resilience that we need to work on, our fragility that we need to work on. Those when we are in this, you know, powerful position. How are we going to use this so that we can do this, truly do this? And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, we get ready to bring your conference to a close. I'm going to have given you your charge. I hope you can take some of that with you. And not just what I have given you, but what you've experienced here with all these people, let it feed you. I know you have all kinds of stuff in your head, but as you go on your trains, planes, automobiles, <laughs> right, let it sink in over the next couple of days. What can I take with me what I learned here today? They sang for you and gave you some medicine. That's medicine, right? These are the kind of things, our practice, that we have to start including in the work that we do or we're not going to make it. We have to do something radically differently from what we've been doing. We call, we call, ja.